from the St. Francis Yacht Club in San Francisco, this is the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon, hosted by Ron Young. Welcome to the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon, live from the virtual grill room of the St. Francis Yacht Club. We hope that you and yours are sheltering in place in a comfortable environment, and we look forward to greeting you back in the Yacht Club just as soon as conditions permit. And we hope that'll be sooner than later, as those of us who ventured into the YC lately find big smiles everywhere. We're all anxious to resume this face-to-face -face fun thing of socializing inside the club. Our speaker today has a completely fascinating tale. In 1630, his ancestors sailed across the Atlantic to Quincy, Massachusetts. They went even so far as to get all the way to Hawaii, where one of his ancestors was the sports editor of the Honolulu Advertiser. In 1850, the other side of our speaker's family migrated from Iran, a long time ago known as Persia, to America to go to school in Berkeley. He would put that activity off while he chased his bride-to-be. They would bring into life our speaker today in 1958. And at the age of 10, he would use his savings to buy an inflatable rubber raft. And he banged around in Facilla Park in Los Gatos in 1977 while a student at Stanford. He took a sailing class and liked the pirateer. And after getting his BA in international relations there, would go on to Berkeley, get his law degree. While a grad student, he would buy a Pearson Ensign, which is a 22-footer that many of us sailed around San Francisco Bay back in those days. He would take it to Southern California, and he sailed around in Goose for 10 years or so, buying a Passport 40 Cayenne, and in 2000, begin his Pack Cup voyages. During the second Pack Cup, he became the communications director. People who are on different boats, different sizes, who leave at different times, wouldn't automatically feel like a community, but for the comms director. And our speaker today did an excellent job as a comms director. He served well at Corinthian Yacht Club on the race committee, and then as Commodore of the Corinthian Yacht Club. And then he really, really took the dive and bought a Santa Cruz 50, Oaxaca, a boat I sailed on in the 80s, and that was boat number seven of the Santa Cruz 50s. In 2019, in his second trans pack with Oaxaca, he got really into the earnest side of racing. And of course, no longer as the comms director, he could concentrate on the race and the results. And in so doing, took first in class, six overall, crossing in nine and a quarter days against a dozen Santa Cruz 50s. So he won a very, very tough class in the Transpac that year. With lots of respect, as friend, I have to say welcome, uh, Michael Morazita, to the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon. Thank you, Ron. It's nice to be here, and I'm honored to be part of the program, particularly uh, since you've invited me to talk about one of my favorite topics, which is racing across oceans. This is a picture of my boat, Oaxaca. I like to say my boat were the temporary uh, custodians of it. I hope to pass it on someday to somebody who will treat it just as well. So a little bit about my background. Ron covered it pretty nicely. I've been going offshore since 98, uh, shortly after getting my Passport 40 Cayenne. And that was a bit of a scary thing for me. Not so much because I was afraid of going offshore. It was just the uh, Coastal Cup race. But I've been building up to it for a number of years. And my fear was, what if I don't like it? What if after having, you know, <laughs> gotten this expensive boat and learned all this training and taken all these classes. What if I don't enjoy it? Well, it turned out I just loved it. It's been an obsession of mine ever since. Uh, as Ron mentioned, I took up racing late. I, I didn't race in college like so many people did. I just started on the uh, Catalina 30 Goose. Originally, I was so intimidated at the start line that uh, I'd end up starting five or 10 minutes late. We're over that now, particularly when Liz Bayless is calling tactics at the start. Uh, as a former world match racing champion, um, we're quite aggressive on that. We've done multiple pack cups on Cayenne and a couple of times on Vallis, which was an island pack at 44. I've served as Commodore of the Pacific Cup twice now, starting a trend. I think Jim Quancy is our second two-time Commodore. And as Ron mentioned, we did very well in 2019. That was our third major outing on Oaxaca, the first being the 2016 Pack Cup, which we took second in, the 2017 Transpac, which we were two hours behind second place, but it was such a tight division that put us in eighth. So we don't talk about that anymore. Um, and then I can't help joining clubs, so I've joined a number of clubs. 
the boat is exciting. I had been racing on my Passport 40 and my friend David Ritchie, who was my co-owner, came up to me at the end of the 2014 Pack Cup and says, uh, are you tired of going this slow? Because I think it had taken us 15 or 16 days, partly because we stopped to help out another boat, but that wasn't his fault. He had extensively researched available boats and he found Oaxaca, number seven, built in the chicken coop down in Santa Cruz. Uh, it had a wonderful history. In fact, we'd been thinking of clever names for boats, but once we settled on Oaxaca, given its history and the number of people that have sailed on it, we stuck with the name. We wanted to preserve that and also carry on the tradition. It's already been dismasted three times, so we figure it's got that out of its system. We're on the fourth mast, the original keel, but the fourth mast. The boat was in excellent shape, didn't have much furniture. It is the lightest or second lightest Santa Cruz 50 out there, the other one being Hula Girl but the rest are kind of loaded down. So we were happy with that. So we look at the boat, we say, okay, what do we need to do to get it ready to cross the ocean? This is a set of requirements that applies to any boat. And we certainly went through this checklist for our own boat. You need to make sure the boat itself is, is principally sound and that you, you know, that's the hull and that you've got the safety gear, the rigging's up to date. And you need to sort of make sure that all your other gear is, is up to the job. We were concerned about our engine. It's the original engine. It's a 1980 Pathfinder, which is a marinized VW engine with an aluminum block. If they overheat, they get destroyed. On the other hand, the Pathfinder gives you the lightest number of pounds per horsepower. It's amazing. You cannot get that ratio in a modern engine because they're all cast iron blocks. So we were very happy that the engine was in good shape. The instruments needed replacing and then the rest of the stuff, the bunks are fine. We haven't changed those at all. Um, we did get all new food, however. We didn't want to use any food that was on the boat. Crossing an ocean is all about preparation. And you can see a number of projects here. I've I've replumbed the tanks. I'm upgrading some of the instrumentation. These are my wonderful electrical tools. We put in some fans. We're having a, a few breaks on the galley stove re-welded. So there's just a bunch of little things. The boat is actually ready to go, but we're always looking to improve things. When we got the boat, we did some initial upgrades. Uh, we replaced all the running rigging. We replaced the old winches with brand new winches that were considerably less heavy. I was amazed when we took the original number 65 winches off and they just weighed a ton. And I picked up the new one and I actually thought that it didn't have the internal gearing because the, the, the weight difference was so significant. We also added a pedestal grinder and you can see that here, this is D Kafari. Uh, putting it through its paces. We did that for a couple of reasons. It's not obvious, of course, but I'm old. I'm 62. And, and a bunch of the crew is old. We're not a bunch of 20-year-old football players. And so, you know, when you need to work the sails, when you need to bring an asymmetrical kite around the force day, that's a lot of work. So that was our, our phase one uh, set of upgrades. And we used that in the 2016 Pack Cup. It went very well. For the pack cup or the trans pack, of course, you need a great deal of safety gear. These are required both by, as I say here, by race rules and common sense. Originally, we had two life rafts. I just recently purchased one 10-person life raft. You need flares, life jackets. You need communications gear, first aid stuff. Interestingly, the first aid stuff is not particularly specified by the rules. So you sort of use your judgment. Uh, I do recall inspecting one boat several years ago where the guy just had this one little like backpacker's first aid kit. And I, I made him upgrade that, which was a good thing because they actually got seriously injured on the trip and having all that stuff helped. You need an anchor and people push back. They say, well, where are you going to anchor? There's nowhere to anchor on the way to Hawaii. And the answer is, of course, on the way to Hawaii, you might end up off course. You might end up heading towards shore, perhaps out of control. And having that anchor will keep you offshore. And of course, you need stuff to uh, cut your rigging loose if you get dismasted. Now, again, Oaxaca's already been dismasted, so we're not worried about that. That's a joke, <laughs> of course. <laughs> One other big expense, if you want to be competitive in a class where the competition is tight, is the sails. The boat came with a lot of sails, and I got kind of a, a sad look from my sailmaker friends and certainly my sailmaker professionals who are ready to sell me sails, saying, yeah, those are sales technically, but you know they're all about to blow up. Uh, so our storm sales are actually in good shape. So we stuck with them, and we got almost all new spinnakers. We actually were able to uh, use the existing number four spinnaker 
and used it as a symmetrical kite, which blew up the second we hoisted it. So that turned out to be a bad move on the pack cup. Just for spare, we took something out of David's garage. Now, interestingly, what happened on, on our first pack cup with the boat was because of a, of a manufacturing error, all of the spinnakers actually failed, except for the old sail we <laughs> dragged out of David's garage. And then that thing stayed up the whole time and we took second place with that. So that was pretty helpful. Depending on the division you're in, in a transocean race, you can get away with fewer sails. You may not need quite so many to keep up. It's important to have some sense of what your competition is doing. After the first pack cup, we decided to try to improve things a bit more. Most of the Santa Cruz 50s have transom scoops. They call them sugar scoops. Uh, ours is actually filled in because we, Scott Eason suggested this, and it was a really good suggestion. We uh, extended the back deck all the way back two more feet as we did the, the, the scoop in the back. So uh, from being very cramped in the back, we could actually hold small dances back there. There's so much room. We added a new rudder. I'll talk about that in a second. And we moved it forward. We also added, because the ORR approved just before the race, a tweener sail, which is a large roach head sail, which is fabulous for close reaching. We got one of those. That has turned out to be a wonderful sail for us. So the new rudder, this is perhaps my favorite purchase. The old rudder you can see here is sort of like a giant Mickey Mouse ear, and it worked pretty good. We'd only round up sometimes. This new one, very high aspect, almost as deep as the keel. In fact, we were a little concerned. It just grabs the water like magic. I've driven the boat out of several near roundups that would never have been possible with the old rudder. And the nice thing is if you've got better control, you're flopping the rudder less. And if you're flopping the rudder less, that means you're bleeding less speed off the boat. And that adds up over 2,000 miles. We moved the rudder forward at Larry's suggestion. Now, we move it forward 10%, so we get 10% less leverage from the rudder. But what we do get is, because moving the fo boat forward on the Santa Cruz 50 puts it about maybe six inches deeper. And the value of that, both from being forward and being deeper, is the top of the rudder doesn't get ventilated. So you don't get those air bubbles at the top of the rudder. It stays attached to the water more firmly, I guess. Uh, and again, it just improves the amount of control you have. So that has been a very, very satisfactory upgrade. We're quite pleased with that. How far did you move the rudder forward? Uh, two feet. So it was, it was at the very aft of the boat, okay? We added two feet to the back of the boat, and we moved the rudder two feet forward. So it is now four feet forward of the very back of the boat. And of course, that back of the boat is somewhat non-structural. We wouldn't have been able to put the rudder back there anyway without a different design. It's a bunch of improvements. We're, we're just super lucky to have it. So it's got more end plate on the top is what you're saying. More end Right, yeah. And end plate supplied by the hull. Yeah, exactly right. right. Also, going down to visit uh, Larry's shop is, is an absolute treat. The, he's, he's a super creative guy. Um, as a technology lawyer, I've, you know, relish the time I've spent dealing with super creative guys. And he's he, he'd fit in with the best of them and just seeing what he's got going on, kicking a few ideas with him and then getting out of there because he's got work to do. Um, it's it's quite a joy. Yeah, Larry Tuttle is the foil master. He yeah, is. Absolutely. The, master. the other the other fun thing is he won't take the job until he can actually put it on his calendar. So I had to like keep at him just to get him to take the commission. Right, right. Uh, so anyway, he's, a, he's, he's really an asset to our sport, particularly if you're looking to upgrade. By the way, if anybody would like to buy a third generation rudder, I still have it in the locker. Good price, just for you. <laughs> <laughs> so Stan Honey tells me that on Comanche, uh, basically what they have is, is, is meal replacement powder, these protein powders, and you have your choice. You can have it hot or you can have it cold. Um, I made that proposal on Oaxaca. And the consensus of the crew was, gosh, Michael, thank you for sharing that viewpoint with us. We're not going to do that. <laughs> so, um, so, you know, for us, I try to have enough food so that we've got about 150% of our, of our estimated travel time because things happen. I plan, as it says here, for, for eight days of nice food and five days of eh, not so good. Three fresh, three frozen. The rest is either dried or free, freeze dried. We use a number of things fairly religiously, one of them being the pressure cooker without the pressure thingy on it, but because it's got a locking lid. 
wait, Michael, something's missing here. I've raced on, uh, as you might know, I sailed across in a transpac with with uh, Cy Kleinman. And mm-hmm. so this, this list is missing the wine. <laughs> are you are you skimping on the crew wine provision? You know, interesting you mentioned that. So so we have I, I, I run a dry race boat. Didn't use to. Uh, and it was never a problem, but particularly on a boat where you have to manage the boat every minute. And we were talking about this before. A huge difference between racing on my old Passport 40 and racing on a Santa Cruz 50. With the Passport 40, Passport 40 is a very easy boat to sail. You, you set the sails, you pick your course, you see how things turn out. Maybe every couple of hours you change something. With a Santa Cruz 50, you have to really carefully be on that helm. You need to grind every wave. It's a lot of work. Um, a glass of wine for the on watch, I've observed, slows down your reflexes. Um, it, it has a cost. One thing we discovered was every time, even for a halfway party, that we opened a bottle of wine or little things, there'd be a squall or we would get a mayday call, which in <laughs> fact happened. I mean, Honest to God. So the first time this happened, huge squall, everything goes to heck, um, you know, and we have to put it all away. The, 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 the second right on, on, uh, on, on Cayenne, we had, we had just opened up some lovely alcoholic beverages and we get this mayday call relayed uh, regarding Tiburon, which, you know, we've talked about in the past, you know, plus only half the crew can drink at a time anyway. So we just, we just go dry. In the 2017 Transpac, I was very firm about this. And then we're starting to have our halfway party and I say, okay, bring out your hidden liquor. Nobody had any. And, and I looked at the crew and I said, seriously, of all the things I said, this is the one you paid attention to. So we'll have, we'll have a little, we'll, we'll have a little bit of a nip, but um, it's just fine to wait till we get there. Just so people know, generally speaking, in my crossings, we don't, nobody on deck ever has any booze. You're right. It just doesn't work out to be productive. But I have to share a funny story. So we're racing across once, and this is a Cy Kleinman story. He's sitting at the nav station, and uh, our cook, we had a cook, she was cooking steaks, unbelievably delicious steaks. <laughs> and the, the custom is you come off watch and you eat, you go to sleep. If somebody gets a steak, somebody else gets a steak. Cy bangs his knife and fork on the nav station and says, where is my steak? few more people get served because we had like a big crew of 13. And where's my steak? Cy chimes out again. And for those who don't know who Cy Climbing was, he was the greatest owner, wonderful guy. Um, very, very fun and colorful and generous and gracious, wonderful. Anyway, after four or five of these, where's my steaks? All of a sudden, the boat broaches like crazy. The boom, you can know the right. boom flown up in the air. And a steak flies all the way across from uh, the galley, from the grill, and hits Cy right in the face and drops into his plate right in front of him on the nav station. And everybody looks at Cy. I mean, is he okay? You know, this steak hit him in the face. And he says, deadpan, he says, it's about time. <laughs> That's wonderful. <laughs> I'm sorry, uh, yeah, don't, don't tell the crew, but I'm actually thinking we're going to have steaks for our halfway party. But it's a big secret. <laughs> I won't tell anybody. <laughs> crew size. What, yeah. what size crew did you go with on the on the uh, first to class finish? Always nine. Total of nine. Um, are you are you count, are you the ninth in the middle? You have four and four and one, or how do, are you on the watch? Uh, I'm on watch. So Liz uh, Bayless has been our navigator for for each three of those, and she's been a non watch stander which uh, actually both of us have been not completely satisfied with that setup. Her, because she doesn't get to drive as much as she likes, and me, because I don't get to skip her as much as I like, because I'm asleep from being worn out from being on watch. So we're actually looking at uh, splitting the job for the 2021 crossing, and, and we'll see how that goes. Um, there's there's a lot of issues involved there. Uh, my my driving skills are are you know, not up to that level of much of the rest of the crew, uh, which I, I hate to admit, but, you know, it, it is what it is. I don't want to slow us down just because I want to drive. On the other hand, it's my boat. So, you know, <laughs> we'll see how that goes. That leads us into a discussion of sort of daily life on, on Oaxaca. We do four hours on, four hours off. I've tried a lot of other schedules and they all work, but for us, this is what works best on Oaxaca. Um, and when you're on watch, we rotate between the, the 
three or four main positions. We don't do a lot of main trim. We probably should. Uh, if we're surfing, we do because, you know, you, um, when you start the surf, the main will lose all its wind. So you need to trim, you need to bring the main back as well as bring in the, uh, bring in the spinnaker to stay attached to the wind to maintain that uh, surfing speed. With luck, you can then catch the next wave and the next wave and the next after that. I don't think I've ever seen us get four, but I've gotten three in a row. And you're, you're four hours off watch or your time to do all your personal stuff or fix something. You see, you can see uh, uh, Patrick Lewis and Tom Pauling here fixing a spinnaker that we punched a hole in somehow. Uh, but this is the fun stuff here. You know, that beautiful weather, flat water, you know, just, just moving along. 2019 race, nothing broke. Unbelievable. Nothing broke. Well, the that's not quite right. The 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 night before the finish, our A2 kite, which was kind of tired, blew up. I was down below. Somebody hands me the sheet because we're going to try to bring it in and says, hold on to that. I hold on to that. <laughs> the damn thing catches air and rips out of my hand uh, and just burns the heck out of my hand. Uh, so I, I come in with a, I think there's some pictures of me somewhere with a, with this like terribly bandaged hand. Um, now, the upside of that for the Transpac, the upside of that was um, I couldn't steer. And I believe I mentioned. <laughs> the performance upside was. The performance upside was I couldn't steer. And they say, oh, Michael, you hurt your hand. We'll do the driving. Are you sure? Are you sure? D. Kafari with, you know, 200,000 miles, including, you know, seven uh, circumnavigations. Are you sure? You don't want me to steer? Oh, that's okay. We'll take care of it. <laughs> so in the Transpac, you know, we had a wonderful, unbelievably skilled crew, wonderful folks. Uh, they gave us a trophy at the end. We did quite well. We corrected out to 12 minutes ahead of the boat ahead of us. First in division, sixth overall. Um, so what you need to win, you need a great crew and a great boat. A plan. You need you need to make the right decisions. You need to be lucky. You need some humor. Fortunately, I'm able to provide the humor, and, and I was able to, to to pull all these other things onto the boat. Uh, you know, with the help of of my par partner. You know, Liz. Liz has been you know great. You know, helping recruit crew and and doing navigating. So that's what it has taken. We advertise, and I'd like to turn to some of the things we're going to be seeing coming up in ocean racing going forward. A lot of the things we're seeing are just the next step in evolution of, of trends that certainly I've been observing over the last 20 years. When I started doing this in 2000, you know, you, you turn on your sideband and a, and a modem of some sort, and you download a weather fax at a fixed time of day. I'm sure Ron remembers this. And, <laughs> yeah. and it would be blurry and it would be like, tilted sideways because you didn't have the speeds quite right and but the worst part of it was it was not really reliable they would take they were doing their best god love them they were doing their best but weather uh was a lot of guesswork back then since then the weather models they've used have improved dramatically in part due to getting feedback from a lot of satellite systems that could uh, compare the forecast to the reality and say, oh, we were using this number wrong. So we now have really quite accurate weather forecasts going out seven, even 10 days. There's forecasts that go out 15 days, but we don't believe those because, you know, come on, let's get serious. What's also going on, of course, is that most of the boats are now using weather routing software. And most of us are all using the same program, which is Expedition. There are other very good ones, but this is what most people are using. So what we have now is everybody using the same data instead of their own guesswork, and they're using the same system to tell them what to do. And, and the result of that is the boats all, particularly a one designer, a very similar class, the boats all follow virtually the same track up to the north to a jibe point and then down south. Back in the day and in the recent Pack Cup, because the weather was crazy, you know, boats would be all over the ocean. They're now clustered much more closely together. And I think that trend's going to continue uh, so long as we don't get another crazy weather year. Another thing we're seeing year after year after year is improvements in long range communication, largely due to the prevalence and, and lower expense of satellite communications. You know, Ron mentions with fondness, and, and I certainly remember it fondly, 
you know, we'd, we'd, we'd fire up our sideband radios. We'd have this children's hour is what we called it, you know, the, the radio chat hour. And, and people really bonded in that. I would also add, as communications chair and running children's hour, I never had to buy my own drinks. Because people, <laughs> people say, oh, that was great. Let me buy you a Mai Tai. It's like, okay. Uh, the last couple of pack cups, the children's hour has been a complete bust, partly because it is so much more convenient to do the check-in with the sat phone. What we'll be doing in the uh, 2022 pack up is we've given up on children's hour altogether. What we are doing is we are requiring people to send in a check-in by email and requesting that they include a little extra information. We will then uh, take, take those reports, long or short, edit them down a bit, and send them out on a daily basis in a fleet-wide newsletter by email. Uh, we did this on the Pack Cup return in 2018, and it was quite popular. And, and we hope that it helps rebuild that same sense of community to the extent possible uh, for, for the Pacific Cup. I don't actually know what the TransPAC intends in this regard. The Pack Cup, after all, is the fun race. Not from anything we've done from a race management standpoint, but there, is, there does appear to be a greater risk of crazy weather. There's, there's a sort of a standard wisdom about what, what the Pacific weather is going to look like. And it just hasn't been that way for years. Um, the Pacific high formation is erratic. Sometimes it doesn't happen. Sometimes it's late. Sometimes it's early. We are, we are absolutely forecast to have more. And the nice, the polite term is tropical disturbances. The scary word is hurricanes. While they very rarely cross our race course, they can have an impact, um, bringing low, low pressure air uh, into the race course. So it's cold, it's wet, uh, it can be stormy near Hawaii. We certainly experienced that in 2016 or 2014, both of them actually. That's just a, a, a reality. Uh, TransPAC is starting late in, 20, in, um, in this year, 2021, starting July 16th. Um, and we'll see if that's a, a real issue. So we're going to see weird stuff, wandering cutoff lows, which are basically little, little difficult storm cells to deal with, all kinds of things. Because of COVID, and the cancellation of the 2020 race, which I, as Commodore, had the honor of canceling. Um, we are looking at a huge turnout for the 2022 Pacific Cup. We rolled over two thirds of the fleet. A bunch of people have signed up. We've got 90 boats on the on the on the entry list right now, with a large waiting list as well. And the waiting list is now closed. So we're, we can we're looking forward to a, a very populated race course, and assuming we're allowed to have them, very populated parties. COVID has had some impacts. TransPAC uh, in particular, they've got a lot of rules regarding COVID. We all need to get tests uh, three, no less, no more than three days before your start. We have to be tested COVID negative. I'm happy to report that everybody on my crew has been vaccinated. Um, but you know, you think about it, a boat crossing an ocean, let's say you're five days out, Four days out, somebody comes down with with this. In some cases, life ending, life threatening disease. What do you do? And I think Transpac uh, is as eager to avoid death by disease as they are to avoid death by boat sinking. I harbor a secret hope that if things get better in the next couple of months, they say, "Okay, we were kidding. We're going to have parties after all." But uh, I don't see any indication of that. I've been in communication with their management, and that doesn't seem likely. Uh, I did speak with the organizers of Cal Offshore Race Week, um, who at, at first thought I was trying to press them to make a decision, and and I got I got back this answer. They said they said, look, there's four different organizations. We can't tell you what's. I said, no, I, I'm not trying to tell you what to do. I'm just asking, do you have a rule? And and the answer is, um, each boat should do what it wants in terms of managing crew. They're not passing any rules there, which makes sense because all the passages are short. San Diego will have an outdoor awards ceremony, and that sounds like about it. I suspect there will be something in Monterey, but I haven't heard yet. Finally, you know, near and dear to my heart, the 2022 Pacific Cup. Uh, we just don't know yet. I won't even say we're thinking about what to do. We're, I mean, we're contemplating it, but we're not even discussing it. We just don't know where things are going to go. So having heard all that, if you want to do an offshore race, I highly recommend it. What do you need to do? Transpac and Pack Cup are probably hard to get, but you could certainly plan on doing a California Offshore Race Week, one or all legs of it. Start building up your crew for your 2023 or 2024 run. 
there is no substitute for practice with with those people and 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 giving the boat some what we used to call in the electronics industry burn in time. You know, you get out there and you'll discover, oh yeah, this doesn't work at night, or oh this doesn't work when we stress it for more than more than uh, one or two hours straight. So you want to get out there. Uh, it is not an inexpensive sport. You want to think about your budget. You want to look at what gear is going to need to be replaced and figure out when is the right time to do that. Um, and then there's some very uh, important skills you need to learn, how to, how to interpret weather information. You cannot just rely on the computer. Offshore safety practices as taught in safety seminars and beyond. And finally, you need to commit to the effort. It's a big commitment. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of money. It's a lot of friendship, unless you're going single-handed. Uh, <laughs> But uh, I have to tell you, uh, for, for my perspective, there's nothing like it. Great, Michael. Thanks for sharing with us your thoughts on the Pack Cup. A couple questions. You said something about a manufacturer error and you blew up some sales. What do you mean by that? <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I, so um, the, the, the set of new kites, what happened was I, I sent them back and I said, hey, can you reinforce the luff. And they did that. And what happened was one of the employees used a, a sewing machine with an oversized needle, you know, on like a soy sauce packet, it's got the little tear here to open, right? Well, they did tears. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So that's what happened on, on all the kites. And everyone that we put up just, just blew up. So we had this antique, undersized, symmetrical kite that we put up. And it was our last kite. We kept it up day and night for three or four days and we took second place with it so <laughs> you know it worked out fine and of course dave and ullman made good and they fixed everything and, and and of course they didn't charge us for it so now let's look at sale choice from the beginning of the race to the end of the race so okay. we're talking about the trans pack where you won class just give us your evolution as the sale plan changes from the first day you're in a starboard tack up the breeze to get over at catalina talk a little bit about what you're using then Okay, and and actually, it's funny you mentioned that because we're making a change in the sale plan there. Um, so the first the first leg of the trans pack uh, is very different from the first leg of the pack cup. The first leg of the pack cup, you know, you you, you tack out to get out of the gate, then you're just doing a, a reach down the coast. Uh, for the trans pack, the first leg is you've got to get up and around the Catalina. north tip of Catalina. For us, that's that's always been a challenge. I say always. The, the two times we've done it, it has been a challenge. <laughs> um, when we got Oaxaca uh, and our new sales, what we got was a heavy number one because we correctly guessed that we were idiots and would be beating the snot out of it. And we needed a sale that wouldn't tear right away. Um, the heavy number one gives us more heel. It had more belly in it than it should have, you know, in retrospect anyway, but it made sense for the bay because it gets us through the waves. But for making that run from San Pedro to Catalina, it just didn't point good, especially when I was driving. That has been pointed out by my crew. Thank you. See, I like to say they're right behind me, but they're not always right behind me. So, so you know, we, we actually, we, as I recall, we did very well at the start. And then just slowly, we sagged behind and below the rest of the fleet. And then we spent the rest of the race after we routed Catalina making up for it. Um, depending on the weather, uh, we'll be making that run sailing not quite close hauled because, you know, the, the key is to get over to Catalina as quickly as possible. Uh, so we'll be footing a bit, not footing so much that we'll be thinking of, of reaching, but just sort of a fat close haul. Assuming prevailing wind, we'll be using our number one jib. We have a new number one jib on order, which is lighter and, and flatter, and that should allow us to point better. Um, and I may give up the wheel sooner than I usually do. If, on the other hand, the wind is more to the right, got a little trouble with right and left. It's really helpful as a sailor. Uh, <laughs> if, it's, if, if the wind is, is more to the right and, and we're, we're basically reaching, we'll probably go with our large roach head sail known as the tweener because that thing just makes the boat, you know, run along. If, if the wind moves a little further, we may even put up a staysail. So you want to get to Catalina. Uh, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing Stan Honey, who is, of course, the tactical guru here, but I'll say it as if it's my idea so I look smarter. You want to get to Catalina. You want to tack up, tack up the shore. You want to go around Catalina. And now, you know, you're starting a run. You, you can ease your sails um, a bit. And depending on wind strength, you keep the one up. You maybe switch to a three if it's strong. But 
you know, given that you're going downwind, you're going to stick with the larger sales. And it's really going to entirely depend on your wind angle, whether you're using the number one or the large roach head sail. In not very long, we're able to switch to spinnakers. Um, if we're sailing, you know, fairly close, we, we may go with our number three, our A3 and a stasel. So an asymmetric number three to begin with and a stasel inside of that. And are you tacking the stasel between the head stay and the mast or up on the weather rail? Again, it's going to it's going to depend on the wind angle. Mm -hmm. uh, and to be honest, it's been two years since we've done it. I can't quite remember. We've got written notes that obviously we're going to have to check. This is this. I, I didn't mention this as as one of the problems in the post COVID era, but it's certainly affecting us. We haven't been able to practice. Our practice race is the Spinnaker Cup, um, uh, and I'm I'm concerned both for us and for other uh, participants in these races that they are that we are underprepared. Um, hopefully, everybody's going to take everything carefully and slowly. Um, but you know, you've you've raised an interesting point. When we first go up with that staysail, we're probably going to have a discussion. Where does this go again? Okay, then you're sailing along. You got the ASM three. Just give us the evolution how you gradually okay. as the wind goes aft. Well, I mean, basically, you know, we'll be we'll be sailing toward hopefully a ridge, a weather and, ridge for those who are paying attention, right? Right. <laughs> right, right. You know, where where the wind will somewhat sharply turn direction, mm -hmm. coming dead aft of us. And once it's behind us, well, then we can go uh, if the wind is somewhat light to the A two spinnaker. If it's heavier, we'll go to our our asymmetrical number four which is the same size, but heavier material. We've got an asymm asymmetrical five, which is considerably heavier and flatter, which we would either use in unreasonably heavy conditions or if we're doing a really tight reach, uh, it serves those. We've also got an A1 if the, if the weather goes extremely light and we've used that in finishing pack cup. Um, it's, a, it's a very lightweight sail, uh, good, for, good for somewhat reachy conditions. What's the most wind you saw in 2019 trans pack? You know, it was a it was a fairly benign passage as as these things go. I'd have to look at our numbers, but you know, we probably saw some gusts in the mid 30s, but we you know, we didn't we didn't have any really sustained difficult stuff. Was this um, in the Molokai channel? Where did you see the most breeze? Probably the night before Molokai when we lost the A2. <laughs> I remember, I remember writing up a description of one of the pack cups, which I thought I was quite the he-man for finishing. And I sent it to Sally, uh, Lindsay, honey, you know, and, and she read it and she said, oh, that looks like a nice benign passage. And it really hurt my feelings. But in retrospect, yes, it actually was. And, and that's, what, that's what we had in the, in the 2019. I mean, it was, it was absolutely just fabulous sailing conditions. Talk about the welcoming party. What time did you land? What time of day? Was <laughs> well, that was, so uh, my wife is still a little angry at me um, for that. So uh, in 2017. Transpac. Transpac. Very good. Um, you know, we finished and, and we hit the dock, you know, like 45 minutes or an hour later. Uh, just because you know you sort of put things away. What well, time of day? What time of day is this now? Uh, 2017. Oh, it was around noon or something. Um, 2019. Well, we got our we've got our stuff together now. We crossed the finish line. They announced it, and we were like at the dock within 20 minutes. I should explain. Transpac differs from Pack Cup in several aspects, but one very important one is each boat gets their own party. Um, and the parties are hosted by somebody on shore. It's a bit of a patchwork. Um, they can range from unbelievably elaborate for Disney to, I guess, a couple of sandwiches and a beer if you sailed in a more 24. Um, <laughs> we, we, were, we were fortunate uh, to have the support of some very dear friends, as well as the Pacific Cup Yacht Club. And we had a very generous setup of, of Hawaiian foods and Mai Tais. And the nice thing was the folks from Horizon and Deception sort of hung around to greet us, uh, as well as some of the other boats, as well as a couple of people who had screwed up the time difference 
and we're there to greet an entirely different boat, which <laughs> which wasn't going to finish for another day. So we had them eat with us too. <laughs> but um, you know, it's 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 nice. It's it's nice actually when there's multiple boats because you can share experiences. Um, What's the top speed you remember the, the boat ever hitting? I was looking at the numbers actually uh, shortly before our man overboard incident in Cal offshore. Uh, we were doing 28 knots. And then, of course, you know, zero while we pulled her back on board. <laughs> <laughs> but we still took second in that race. <laughs> so give me the sail plan when you were going 28 knots. Um, wave, yes, but what was the sail? What sails did you have up? Uh, so that was, of course, the main. Uh, we did not have a staysail up. Pretty sure it was the A3. Mm -hmm. It was that we, we were on, we were on a, on, it was a pretty reachy course at that point. And in the Transpac 2019, what was your fastest speed you in the crossing? Well, I know I saw 27. I, I bet if I went through the, uh, I bet if I went through the, uh, expedition logs, I'd probably find a 28. Mm -hmm. um, talk to me about a scary moment in the race in the 2019 Transpac. Probably the 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 scariest moment was was when we blew the A2, and this I think is an indicator that you're doing well. We didn't have scary moments. Nothing broke. Nobody fell off the boat. Um, uh, you know, I, I guess you know the the, the fear that somebody is going to try to serve me beets or kale might have been the scariest thing, but that didn't happen either. Uh, no, it it was it was it was um, it was a, a very uh, satisfactory, event free race, and I think you know that's that's part of what makes for a successful uh, competitive effort. So you're going to go on Transpac 2021. Yes. You're going to go in PAC Cup 2022. No, sir. If, if, no? No, no. Um, okay. I discovered, uh, we, so we did back-to-back -back TransPAC PAC Cup in uh, 16 and 17, and it is exhausting for me, both financially and uh, physically. So uh, uh, at, at most one every other year for us. Uh, Who would you consider the biggest competition when you were going, when, when you're sailing? Who were you thinking about? Who were you sort of constantly seeing, comparing yourself to as you're as you're racing across? Um, well, so our our standing competition uh, has been Horizon, very well prepared boat, fairly turboed, typically professionally crewed, um, and they do quite well. I remember when I when I sat down with uh, with with the rigger and I, and he said, "What's your goal?" I said, "I want to beat Deception and scare Horizon." And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and we appear to have been accomplishing that. Um, on on this particular race, we were keeping a, a close eye on uh, Horizon and on Lucky Duck, which is a Santa Cruz fifty two. And the the interesting thing, you know, with Horizon, we can do boat for boat tactics because they make sense. With with the fifty two, the boat is sufficiently different that you can't just say, "Well, they're doing this, so let's us do this." We have to sail our own race. Um, so I think it was a lucky duck and triumph that were up in the north and it was horizon and somebody else down with us to the south and then, you know, more boats a little further back, but that was sort of the lead pack. So at first, of course, we were, we were, you know, second guessing our decision to be south and seeing how they were doing up north. And uh, once we started to pull ahead, we uh, late in the race, though, we felt better about that for, uh, for the finish uh, coming along Molokai, of course, we were you know, now in, in real time tracking positions. So we were trying to take a very close uh, notice of what tactic and, and path they followed along along the shoreline. Talk about your the way you were thinking about composition of the crew. Well, and Liz is the is the absolute Svengali of that. But um, we, we largely see eye to eye. I mean, there's some overarching things. You, you need people that are that are pleasant to sail with that are not particularly prima donnas that will you know show up when they say they're going to show up. Uh, and that have got some skill. We need a high percentage of good drivers. Um, it is just so important uh, in in boats like ours. Um, you can't you can't just say, well, you know, it's close enough on the passport. Close enough. Um, it doesn't it doesn't have that huge an impact on boat speed. Whereas with the with the Santa Cruz fifty and the and the sled type boats. Um, 
your your ability to steer a straight line without without a lot of wavering it, it just makes a tremendous difference in in your boat speed and your performance so we want to make sure we've got people like that we need we need some people with strength we need some people we need at least two people that are that are competent on the foredeck you know for major maneuvers it's an all hands thing you could theoretically get away with one one bow person but it's nice not to have to do that um i can actually do bow but nobody wants me up there because <laughs> it slows the boat down. Uh, uh, so um, we've been very lucky. You know, we got we got uh, uh, Patrick Lewis. He's been on the crew several times, uh, and he's uh, a graduate of of Dave Hodges Loft down at Ullman. And you know, boy, we we had some tremendous people: Dee Kafari, Harry Spedding, Molly Noble. You know, I'm looking at I'm looking at a picture here. Uh, Patrick Lewis, Brett DeWire, Liz Bales. Um, you need people whose head is in the game every second they're on deck for what can I do to make the boat go faster? You need that kind of thinking on the deck just to stay on the ball. So, Michael, um, it's been great listening to you talk about your offshore experience and specifically winning the Transpac 2019. What advice, give me one summary piece of advice would you give to any of those boat owners who've been watching this video and who've never done a Transpac ever before? Give me a couple pieces of advice for those folks. Well, the number one piece of advice is, is do it. Um, if, if your boat is at, all, is at all competent to do the passage, go in the, go in the boat you've got, go in the boat you know. Um, and what you want to do as soon as you can is pull some crew together and you know get out there and do some overnights make sure you like it uh one of the one of the smartest things we did in pack cup i say smartest thing because of my idea uh, <laughs> is is we added the requirement of a qualifying voyage and it wasn't much of a requirement 150 miles overnight mostly sail mostly out the gate and we had about six boats do that and drop out and I thought that was great because these are people who discovered that, you know, their boat wasn't up to it or they weren't up to it or it just wasn't for them. And you want to you want to know early on if this is going to bring you joy or just suck, you know, so get out there. And then, of course, you know, you, you, you need to get the boat ready. You need to you need to, you know, be confident that your standing rigging is is in shape. You want to be confident that your sails will stand it. Um, Cami Richards is very fond of pointing out that, you know, one crossing of the Pacific is the equivalent of doing about a hundred races back to back. So you don't get to, you don't get to stop at the supply barge halfway across, uh, and get a new shackle, uh, or swap out crew, <laughs> you know, uh, you, you got, you got to commit the whole thing. That's part of the excitement. That's part of the thrill. Michael Morozida, member of the St. Francis Yacht Club and the Corinthian Yacht Club, staff commodore of the Corinthian Yacht Club, and a participant in multiple pack cups and trans packs, great contributor to those activities, in fact, and winner of his class in the 2019 trans pack. We appreciate very much your participating in the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon. Thanks so much. Be fun to see you around the bar when we can all see each other again. Good on you, mate. Thanks for having me. This has been a presentation of the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon.